What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share the video, and uh, we promise not to disappoint you today. Bringing my brother Cameron back on. Good dude. We're going to talk about Coleman 2. We're going to talk about the Smooth Program. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff. We're going to talk about addiction and, you know, him losing one of his friends. We're going to get into it. Cam, what's up, man? How you feeling today, brother? I'm all right, man. How y'all doing out there today, man? I'm glad to, I'm glad to have you back for a part two, man, because the other day I was under the weather. My Zoom wasn't working. I had to update it. All kinds of stuff was going on. But we're back, man. And I want to take you back to the SMU program, some of the things that you've seen, some of the things that you've been through. I want to talk about, you know, the addiction that you're struggling with right now and, you know, some other stuff as far as your friends go and all of that. So let's just go back to the smooth program, man. What was it like, man, for a guy to go to the smooth program where you're going to be locked in a cell where you're like, damn, man, I don't want to live like this? I mean, bro, it it, it was hell. I'm not going to lie. Like, you know, you had touched on it on your uh, video about the smooth, talking about the cell was the size of a parking space. And literally it was. I could stand in the middle of my cell, put my hands out and touch each wall like with palms flat. Like, that's how wide it was. And then it's 10 feet long. You know, there's another dude. There's a bunk bed, a table, a toilet. Like, there's – both of y'all can't be up on the floor at the same time. There was no AC. In G unit where I was for a while, uh, stainless steel walls, when it was the hottest summer on record, like 30 years, bro, it was hell, man. I used to uh, just be laying in my cell, man, at nighttime, hearing people yell out the window, sweating. And I used to tell myself, like, man, this is what you got to remember when you hit the streets. Like, you don't want to do this again. And, um, you know, I always kept that with me, man. It was just, it was nothing nice. Were there ever times when you were sitting in that cell and you were thinking, like, damn, man, I ain't going to make it out of here, man. Did you ever feel you were going to die from heat, anything? I mean, I won't say, like, I felt like I was going to die from heat. But, I mean, with just all the violence going on, <clears throat> Yo, it'd be so easy to get crossed up there. I didn't, you know, I got nothing bad in my jacket and I'm not messed up in any way, but they're crossing dudes up for any reason up there. You know, people's world gets shrunk down to you and your celly and then the dudes you go out in your wreck cage with. And you got all these sharks that have been on compounds, man, and when their world gets that small, you know, they start looking at the people they can get at. And it's only a select few, man, and people find it any reason to hit somebody. And, uh, I mean, yeah, like, it definitely crossed my mind, man. You know, one false move, is I could lose my life up there because people were. Like, dudes were looking for reasons to kill somebody there, to try to get sent out of there. So dudes were willing to kill people to get sent out of there to go where? Trying to go to ADX. Want to go to the ADX, why? Because they were so miserable there that they felt like the ADX would be better because yeah. they had a TV, single cell. Single cell, the single cell having a TV. Like dudes were, you know, in ADX, I think it's like a seven year program, like at the minimum. And they were, yeah, they were willing to catch a body to try to get put on the wait list and get sent to ADX. Besides trying to make it through that program at, you know, like a little less than two years, you could do it. But man, it was, and it was nothing nice. It was a war zone, bro. And like I said, I got there when they just had opened it up. So, you know, the uh, the administration was really still on some, like, we're not going to give an inch to these dudes because people are coming out the shoe. They've been locked up. You know, they know all the tricks, like grabbing a bean slot and, you know, trying to do little stupid stuff. Man, they had stuff for you, man. They had all kinds of toys they, they used to like to play with, man. They had, uh, you know, the beanbag gun. Man, they had the pepper spray guns. One time I'm getting walked to a uh, wreck. Or I was getting walked to medical, man. I hear on the radio, uh, the cop that's taking me over there, you know, they had a disturbance over in one of the other units. And the lieutenant said, uh, go get the devastator. <laughs> you know, that made me stop. Like, the devastator? What the hell is the devastator? And uh, I seen it one day. It was like, man, you remember, like, the potato guns they used to make out of, like, PVC? Yeah. You know, okay, it was something like that, but it was stainless steel. And it had a long barrel, and about halfway down, about like three, four feet in, there was a big rectangular, like metal piece. 
and then it continued to barrel down. So what they do, they put it up and that rectangular, you know, plate would go up against your bean slot and they lock it in and they, they spin the back off and they get the big cans of pepper spray and put the can in there, screw it back on and they'd hit this button and it would just like shoot the whole can at one time, just like zoop. And dude's whole room was painted. Yeah, I seen a man do it happened to a dude right across the way from me one day, man. And um not anything you want to get hit with. Yeah, it was it was devastating, I'll tell you that. Well, definitely so. the devastator, how they go in there and just hit you with that. You can't breathe, you're on the floor. They probably don't even have to send anyone in to get you. They could probably just drag you out at that point, right? Yeah, no, dudes are begging, you know, got their hands out there being slapped, please cuff me up, I'm ready to go. But you know, that messes the whole tear up. There's no AC there. You know, that creeps in the vents, it'll go upstairs, whatever, man. Like, man, it was not a fun place to be at. I'll tell you that. Like, it really was not. So, I mean, when they hit the Devastator, people that never been in places like that, you're in your cell, you're up there reading a book, minding your business. They might have done this on another range. Next thing you know, you can't breathe. The shit's coming yeah. in your cell. What do dudes oh, do yeah. in prison when that stuff starts seeping into your cell? I mean, what can you do? You know, you can try to block the vent up. Or something, but it don't it don't matter, man. It comes through, you know, because they had uh they had windows like you could, you know, like a little screw thing and open the window with a screen on the back, you know. But that stuff creep in from everywhere, man. It was an old place built in the early 1900s, man. Like you can't, you just gotta live with it. You know, I had plenty of days, man. I'm taking a nap in the daytime. You know, wake up coughing and stuff because I don't know where somewhere on, on a different floor. <clears throat> Was getting pepper sprayed. Hey, you just got to deal with it. Ain't nothing you can do. Did you ever have any problems over there yourself, Cam? I mean, I had no issue. I mean, like, uh, I had my first celly I had uh, when I got there. <clears throat> like, we all had ended up having to jump on him because he was like a sex offender. My homeboy came from another prison with him, actually had paperwork on him, had the shoe roster where it said right there his name and number. And it said sex offender on it. Um, so, you know, we all collectively jumped on him. But, I mean, that was it as far as, you know what I'm saying, I had nothing directed towards me, you know, but. Was there ever a time when you, you know, you're living with the same dude so long, you start to get ag agitated, you're like, man, I don't even want to be around this dude no more, man. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, man, my homeboy Rudy, man. Uh, now, I love Rudy to death. He was, he was an older head. He had been locked up about 20 years by the time he got to the smooth. And uh, real good dude, respected everywhere. But man, he was just like older, set in his ways. <clears throat> and me and him were sellies for like over a year. And we probably had a good six, seven months out of, I don't know, we might have been sellies 13 or 14 months total. And six or seven of them, we probably didn't say two sentences a day to each other for like months on end. Like, we can't stand each other. Like, we're living right on top of each other. We don't even talk to each other. You know, um, it's aggravating, man, but there's nothing you can do. You know, when you're in a setting like that, like, you're not going to get along with people. When he's on the toilet taking a shit, man, I roll over my bunk and might kick him accidentally. That's how small the cell is. You know, so when, yeah, when you're forced to live in a situation like that, man, you know, you just, you're going to rub people the wrong way, man. You ain't going to be cool all the time. You know, it's crazy, man, that you can live in a space with dudes and not talk to them. I mean, you're living in this little cell, and I'm not talking to you no more, man. You you, you stay there. I stay here. Don't talk to me, man. Don't pick up my tray. Don't do nothing. And, you know, you guys coexisted like that. But there are times when there's two cellies in the Smooth program and Big Sandy and USP Pollock where they don't get along. They ain't talking to each other, and it gets violent, right? Oh, yeah. It definitely happens, man. And it was happening there. Like I said, dudes, man, man. Dudes was killing their cellies. They was doing a lot of, you know, nasty stuff up there. You know, they were, like I said, some dudes were looking for a reason just to try to get out of there. And other dudes just, you know, they already got, you know, so-called the worst of the worst in the system that they were sent into this program. And, yeah, man, only like forced to live together under those conditions, man, dudes. Yeah, there was a lot of violence in the cell. It was just, man... It was wild, man. And then, like, you know, they started stabbing cops up there. You know, and that got real crazy. Like, when they did that, man, um, them AB dudes. 
I guess supposedly, you know, I had talked to Terry, who was um, on the yard with me over at Victorville, and he was telling me how they had set it up. I think when James Lumpy was on, and he was talking about when they first got to the smooth, how they had nothing coming, and like they all went on a coordinated hunger strike, and the captain got down there and said he was going to give them certain things. You, you remember what I'm talking about? So at that time, you know, there was still more stuff certain dudes, you know, were wanting more than just like a little bit of, uh, you know, coffee or whatever they were going to sell them. And, you know, how Terry explained to me that the heads of all the gangs like had kind of got together and said that they were going to start hitting cops, you know, to force the issue. And uh, the brand said they would do, they would jump off first, stab a cop. And then as soon as they come off, I mean, we're already locked down 23 and one, but we went on a worse lockdown and like, as soon as they start moving it like regular, another game was supposed to hit up, you know, but the brand was the only ones that did it, but they did it twice back to back, man. Um, first time they made a spear, man. And uh, it was like, it was the cops like first or second day working there too. They made a spear, man. When he came to feed them the uh, breakfast trays, man, dude just ran it out there, stabbed him right in the gut. Yeah. Hit him. And, um, you know, it was, it was on the whole other side of the prison for me. I remember, you know, they had came through and did the rec list on our unit and telling everybody, okay, get ready for rec, get ready for rec. So I'm up, you know, on my bunk waiting and waiting. And it's like, you know, all of a sudden an hour goes by, two hours. They ain't coming back and getting us. So I'm like, you know, I figured something happened, but I don't know what. And uh, Leo, you had talked about Leo, uh, the, the black skinhead from, you said he was from New York? He's really from New York, but tells people he's from Massachusetts, but he's yeah, really from they, New York. He said he's from Boston, right? So I didn't know Leo at the time. He ended up moving on the range from me, like, later on down the line. I like Leo, but um, he was in another unit that I like, morning. I like Leo, too, man. Yeah, he's he's good people, man. He's he's crazy, but um, but that morning, you know, we're sitting around waiting for wreck. Nothing's moving. I'm starting to lay down and just go back to sleep. And... uh Leo yells to me for whatever reason, you know, from the other range, because, you know, we had the windows you could open up and you could yell over, you know, the other parts of the prison. And, you know, he got that voice, hey, tree. You know, he's just yelling my name. And I'm like, hey, what's up, man? And he's like, man, let all the white dudes know over there that Big Terry and them, they hit a cop over in Z Block, you know, and they're going to come through. And I'm sitting there thinking, damn, man, why the fuck? Like, I didn't even know Leo. Like, I don't know who told him to tell me. But, like, why are you screaming my name out with that shit? Because I knew, like, they were going to be tripping, man. They, they stabbed the cop. They were. They came through. They tore our shit up, man. We had box lunches for weeks. And then the first time we're going back out to wreck again, sign us up for wreck. It's like the same exact thing, man. Say, hey, G unit, get ready for wreck. And then we're just sitting there, sitting there. And then the brand dudes again had uh, this time – a dude, Ryan, was from Utah that was out at Victorville. And uh, he was trying to get down with them. And I guess he had slipped his cuffs when they came to get him for wreck. And he stabbed another cop. And, man, they were mad about that shit. When yeah, we cop, had... When a cop yeah, gets stabbed, when a cop gets stabbed, tell the people kind of like what they do. Yeah, they give you box lunches, but are they just completely nasty? I mean, are they hitting people? Are the cops starting to beat up prisoners over there? What's going um, on? Well, yeah, Lewisburg was always, it was an old school prison with a lot of, um, you know, corners where the cameras ain't, don't be at, you know, they had the stairwells, there was no cameras in the stairwells. Yeah, they fucked dudes up. They had no problem fucking dudes up. And I know them brand dudes, like they got taken in the stairwell and probably bounced down the steps and all that. Um, you know, as far as the food went, they had prepackaged little like box lunches. So, I mean, it's just bologna sandwiches and shit, but no hot, you know, usually you get a hot meal every three days. Now, I didn't, we didn't see a hot meal for probably a month, bro. They weren't taking us to showers. I mean, you couldn't get no toilet paper. Just like nobody had nothing coming in the whole prison for a while. They can play the game both ways. The cops can play the game. The prisoners can play the game. I mean, it, exactly. it, it's, it's, all, it's all around. You end up leaving the SMOO program and you go to USP Coleman, right? Yes, sir. And I show up not too long after you show up, and me and you start hanging out. We're out there hooping together. We're playing ball, and you know you're 
you're, you're a pretty good ball player. So eventually your homeboys from Florida are like, nah, Tree, you're coming over here. And you used to hoop every morning over there with them dudes. Do you remember that on the week? Well, every weekend? Yeah, 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 man. You know, that was, you know, the whole time I was down, man, I always, I, I love to play ball, man. I'm okay. I'm just usually one of the tallest dudes on the compound. So, you know, I play a little bit. Uh, but yeah, man, I remember, I remember you coming there and see, it's kind of funny to me, you know, what all the viewers don't understand, you know, because your demeanor on here, Chad, you know, I mean, you was always a good dude, bro. But, you know, how you were when I first met you, you know, you got to think when I met you, you still had 30 years to do in prison. And, uh, man, you were wild, bro. And, you know, I was coming up to the end of my bid. I had like, I got down to about a year left. And I know... <laughs> You know, it seemed like every day, man, it was something new, man. Somebody was doing something, and you was wanting to run up on them. You wanted to check people. And I'm just kind of like, hey, come on, Chad, man. You know, just let that shit go. And I can't blame you. You know, you had that mindset, bro. Like, you were in bid mode, bro. You had, like, there was no light at the end of the tunnel for you still. And I remember, like, I felt like, man, I got to get away from this dude, man. He's going to get me in a wreck. But, uh, you know, but it wasn't on no bullshit, you know. I mean, it was justified things, but yeah, you you definitely calmed down a lot, Chad, and I, and I love to see that. Well, I always, you know, as crazy as it might sound, I, you know, I always looked up to you a little bit, like, man, Tree's a pretty intelligent dude. He's been, you know, oh, different places. Looked up to him. <laughs> and then we, we kind of like, we just quit talking one day, and I'm like, I didn't even know why. I'm like, what's up? And eventually, we never talk again, man. We ended up going our separate ways, and... I go to a different prison. I end up getting involved in something at the prison where um, them dudes had jumped on the Serenio and, you know, I ended up doing something to, F what the hell was his name? Phil or whatever from Connecticut. I end up leaving. You end up leaving. We never talk again. And you end up seeing me on YouTube and you hit me up. And I'm like, oh, I tell my wife, like, yo, this is my boy right here. I can't believe he, you know, that you had reached out to me. And, that, you know, and now we're talking. And I never knew why you had, you know, stopped talking to me because we never had that conversation, bro. It was just like. Okay, whatever. And there was a little bit of animosity, you know what I mean? Um, at least on my part, where I was yeah. like, and I'm gonna keep it real. I was like, man, fuck that dude. But really, man, my feelings were hurt. Okay, too. You know what I'm saying? Like, I and you know that's why when <clears throat> I had, <clears throat> excuse me, when I had reached out to you, you know, I had asked you, like, man, bro, there wasn't no bad blood or nothing, was it? Um, because I couldn't really remember. Man, I mean, that's been, man, that's been over 10 years now. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> a lot of shit happened. I do remember kind of like separating myself from you. And I know <clears throat> part of it was my celly too, Hobby. You didn't really vibe with Hobby at all, man. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I couldn't really remember. But see, that is a problem. Like, that's something, man, I do, man. It's, it's a bad thing. Like, I'm quick to, I try to stop problems before they, come up and I'll see something just on anything, man. And like, I got no problem. Just kind of like, all right, man, we ain't on the same thing, man. I'm just gonna go my way and just act like, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna do me, you do you type shit. And that's not cool. That's, and, and it's really not some man shit. You know what I'm saying? Because, cause man, I fought with you 1000 chat and like, you definitely deserve, you know what I'm saying? Motherfucker come talk to you and shit. But at the same time, like, I'm sure I would felt, like, man, I can't talk to this dude because he just, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, too, he was hard to talk to. Me you were too time. big. You were too big for me to be trying to fight you, though. <laughs> oh, nah, I mean, yeah, that's one thing. I wouldn't hate, but you got them hands now. You yeah, always had them hands. It's all good. Listen, let's talk about, you know, we, we do. We end up connecting. I'm like, damn, man, I really cared about you as a friend, man. I meant that, you know? And I was oh, a little exactly. wild back then. And, you know, I, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a troublemaker at times, but. You know, I'm. You know, I. You know, I've had the opportunity to grow, and I'm. I'm happy about that. Let's talk about. Let's talk about your life, man, in in how you grew up. Like, what kind of household did you grow up in? Because we're gonna get into this addiction thing too. Something that we talked about when we were over there, right? So yeah. let's talk a little bit about how you grew up. Well, you know, so I mean, honestly, man, uh, especially my younger years, man, man, I had a good family. You know, my parents, you know, they work, man. Um, I was afforded a lot of opportunities in this world that I squandered. You know, my parents set me up 
to be somebody, to do something. And, you know, I fucking 21 years old, fucking go to federal prison. That's what I do, you know. Um, you know, it wasn't all, you know, lovey-dovey at home. You know, my father was an alcoholic and shit. My parents split when I was 13. You know, there was a time I had hated my father at that time um, when my parents split. Um, just from his drinking and just a lot of shit he was doing, man. I, I was... I didn't respect it whatsoever. And it's like, I really feel bad now looking back on it because it's kind of like, man, I'm walking my father's shoes, man. And he was just a man living with his demons, doing the best he could, trying to provide for his family and do whatever. You know, I didn't see it that way as a kid, but um, yeah, I didn't like grow up in the hood or nothing like that, man. I fucking thought it was cool. I put myself in the hood. You know what I'm saying? I used to go hang out down there, man, because... Shit, I listen to rap music and fucking, you know what I'm saying? That's, you know, it, I was misguided, bro. Like, you know, it's one thing, man. I feel like, you know, society is done. They made, you know, selling dope and being a gangster and all that. They try to commercialize that and make people think it's cool. And like the youth, man, they, they gravitate towards that shit. And, um, you know, a lot of young kids, man, get jammed up and doing this silly shit trying to play gangster. Um, and the one thing about it, I feel like even though I put myself in that situation, like I always understood what I was getting into. And I do know with a certain lifestyle, other shit comes with it. As far as going to prison and doing whatever, like, you know, there's a certain code you're supposed to live by. And, um, you know, I adhere to that. But most people don't. You know, you got people, you know, these kids with money that want to play gangster and like be cool. And then when shit gets real, you know, they it's not fun to them no more. So they're not trying to be gangster no more. They're they're quick to tell and try to do whatever they can to get out of it. Um, and it's like a vicious cycle, man. It's got, you know, I mean, it's still going on today, man. That's a big thing. Like, I, I hate to see the youth, man, going through just the same shit I went through, man, and getting jammed up on the same shit. And, you know, I try to, I try to tell youngsters all the time. You know, there's a better way and do something better. But, you know, you can't tell a man nothing. Nobody could have told me nothing back in that day. Like, yeah, OK, yeah, you don't know. And like, But, you know, people got to find out for themselves, man. But it's sad, like, because, man, this is not what it is. Talk about let's talk about, you know, the whole heroin thing and fentanyl and you're in prison. Right. And I mean, I think we might have touched on this. You, you start really getting high in prison. Right. Yeah, I mean, like I, I've been getting high since I was 13 and doing shit, but like my my real like opiate addiction like really took hold and took off in prison. Like I, I never used a needle until I came to prison. And um yeah, you know, I was strung out on heroin for like, you know, for a while in prison, man, and uh, you know, and that's something I carry to this day. You know, um, and I'm not just an opiate user, you know, I I'm I'm a drug addict. You know, uh, when I was in drug class, you know, you have to go for probation or whatnot. The counselor asked me, uh, Cameron, what's your drug of choice? I told him more. I don't really care. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like whatever. But I mean, opiates are, you know, the thing that like it just, you know, it's got the whole country messed up, man. People are dying left and right from it. it it's a fucked up thing, man. And it's like I battle that shit every day. But, you know, it is what it is. Let's talk about how people get needles in prison. How are people shooting up in prison, bro? Like, are they making needles? Are they coming in? I mean, are they stealing them from medical? Yeah, at, at my first prison at Fort Worth, since it was a medical center, they had a hospital there. And dudes were stealing, you know, real, you know, just regular needles, you know, U100s out of the hospital. Um, anywhere else I went to, they would make what they call binkies. But usually dudes would like get a needle mailed in like behind a stamp or something like that. And then they, you know, they set it like into a, um, a big pen, melt it in there and then get a nipple from the milk bags and tie it on there and, you know, fashion something. Sometimes they might steal them from like the diabetic um, nurse, like try to break it off or something, get it. But um, yeah, we're, I mean, where there's a will, there's a way, man. You know, dudes are getting them. They're making that shit. And, it, and it's a nasty thing, man. Like, 
I said, I didn't know nothing about it, bro. And all of a sudden, I, I'm using a needle. I'm using a needle that like 10 people in the unit all share. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I didn't even know that wasn't cool to do because I, I I wasn't with that shit. You know, it's, it's a fucked up thing, man. Were you scared, man, of ever catching HIV in there? I mean, shit, not really. I mean, nobody else I'm, I'm hanging with is scared of it. So, you know what I'm saying? I'm not thinking nothing of it. Like, I wasn't, bro, I mean, I was, right, I man, was listen, stupid. the addiction overpowers your intelligence, man. Were you in, yeah. were you in USP, well, were you in USP Victorville when Jimmy Mack was there? Now, I don't know. I don't think I was there with Jimmy Mack. Um, I remember, I don't know, did he go to the smooth though? Because I used to hear his name shouted out, like there was a little college station at Lewisburg um, that played music. And then one night there was like a punk rock show. And I used to hear them like shout out Jimmy Mack, I'm pretty sure. But um, I don't think he was on the compound at the same time as me. You know, he might have been in the shoe, you know, getting transferred when I got there. You remember Kahuna from Colton? Co Man, listen, Kahuna sent me a Christmas card in oh, yeah, prison, was, brother. Oh, he was a good, good dude, man. But he went know, home, he was, when he went home, he wrote me, man, and sent me a couple, couple Christmas cards for two, three years in a row, man. Yeah, my first couple years out. Man, I used to have him on Facebook when I used to have Facebook, man. We used to talk, man. He was doing good. He's in Phoenix. He was doing good. But, uh, you know, he was in, in the shoe with Victorville. Like, when I hit the penitentiary, you know, he already had some kind of incident happen and was in the shoe. So, like, I never met him there. I met him up in the smooth program. Well, he saw me in the smooth program. I remember <laughs> the first time he ever saw me, you know, he was on. He was in a different wing and just out the wreck cages. Uh, him and his homeboys that, you know, he was on the wing with. They happened to be in the red cages across from us. And um, I was talking to somebody. I think it was uh, Double Barrel Daryl and Jake. Oh, you probably did. I don't know if you knew them. A couple skinheads. Uh, but I was talking. They were with him, whatever wing he was on. And when I'm yelling over to them in the red cage, you know, I got it all the time. Like them older heads from California. You know, when they first see me. They be looking at me, I have gold in my mouth and all tatted up and talking, you know, with slang. They be thinking, who the fuck is this dude? You know, and Kahuna definitely looked at me like that. Like, what the fuck is wrong with this kid? But uh, when we got to Coleman together, man, you know, good dude, man. I fought with him tough. So, you know, someone asked me that on there. So did this kid have gold teeth when he was in federal prison? Yeah, I you had some. Them. I had a couple, yeah. So, you know, the white dudes, were they receptive, man? Or they like... I mean, when a white dude comes in with gold teeth, what do they what do they look at you like? I mean, tell them. Yeah, no, they they were not feeling me. It, like I never got it until I got to the FCI at Victorville, and yeah, man, dudes looked at me sideways for a long time. You know, there. Um, you know, it was crazy, and I used to sit back and just you know. I would trip on them and I would think like, okay, yeah, man, I might have gold teeth. I might like rap music or whatever, you know, but that's because I'm from where I'm from. And I was raised how I was raised. You know, if y'all dudes was from my neighborhood, you would be just like me, you know? And, uh, but I used to trip on them dudes walking around with Swazis tatted on their face and shit. And I'm not going to lie, man, dude like that walking my neighborhood back in the day, we'd have jumped on him just from GP. You know what I'm saying? Like what the fuck? And I, you know, I had to really kind of, turn my thoughts around and look at it the same way, man. You know, why am I looking at him? So, you know, I, I want them to look at me as a man and look past my outer shit, but I don't afford them the same courtesy. And I had to start looking at it like that. Like, man, you know, I'd be swazied out and all that if I was from wherever they're from. And um, I kind of had to like let go of my, you know, animosity I'd be holding towards them. And just, I just learned to do me, man. And I know I'm a good dude. One thing about it. You know, and actions, you know, that it, everything comes out in the wash, man. And certain incidents happen. And, you know, when I'd be there standing up for the white dudes, you know, eventually, you know, the dudes respected me after I was there for a while and shit. And, uh, you know, they would still, they'd be like, oh, man, that's just tree, man. You know, he, but they'd be like, he's kind of jiggy, but it's a good white dude right there. Hey, you, uh, I mean, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people know you. You're well respected in, in the federal prison system. I know that. Um, Let's talk more about this addiction thing. You're still, you're still addicted, right? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, man, it's demons, man. I live with man. Um, 
And it's like, I can't shake it, bro. You know, and it's a sad thing, man. Like, because, bro, I, I had so many opportunities in life to do a lot of shit, man. And I don't, drugs don't make me do anything. You know, one thing about it, I know I'm a good person. And I always try to do the right thing. And I don't give in to, like, you know, somebody acts this way just because they're hooked on drugs. Like, I, I make my decisions I make whether I'm on drugs or not. You know, it's easier to give in to your addiction and do some foul shit because you're dope sick or something. But you still know you're doing the wrong thing. And see, that's one thing I, I just I refuse to do. Like, I don't I don't junkie stunt people. I don't lie to people. I just don't, you know, I live a certain type of way, man, because I don't feel like, you know, screwing somebody over to get my next fix. So I'm not sick for a little bit. is a good thing. Cause I'm just going to be sick again in a few hours. And now, you know, I don't need more enemies. So I'm just like, you know, I try to be a stand up dude and have integrity and honesty in everything I do. You know, not a lot of people do it like that. And society will give addicts an out. People always say, oh, that's not him. That's just the drugs. He's not like that. When, but that's bullshit, man. You know what I'm saying? You you know what you're doing at all times. And, um, you know, if you're a scumbag, you're going to do scumbag shit. If you're not, you know, you're not. And um, But I can't shake it, man. You know, something, you know, I might be living with forever. I don't know. You know, the other day you told me something. You said, man, you know, I'm not clean because I like getting high. Do you really I'm feel that way? Man. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, straight up, I I do like getting high. That's why I started getting high, you know, started doing it and partying. Uh, I don't like being dope. I don't like not having anything and being laid out in my bed for days on end. You know, I don't I don't like all the bullshit that comes with it. I really don't. You know, it's like I try to get a job. All right, cool. I can work. But like, as long as I, I got money to stay well so I can go to work, but you know, I fuck up a job one day, just not being able to go cop. So I got something to wake up with the next day. And, you know, I, I don't like that. You know, um, I mean, honestly, yeah, I wish I could stop getting high, but yeah, there's a part of me still that I, I kind of have a self-destruct button. I've always had. I can't be doing too good, man. And I, if if so, it's like I just like hit this button and blow everything up. And um, you know, drugs is the way I do that shit. So you 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 did come out of prison, and I know you talked about Lewisburg, and you thought like, man, I never want to forget this stuff. But you came out here, and you know, I'm not gonna we're not gonna get too in depth, but you yeah. you, you end up getting you, you end up start you start getting money, man. Really, man, with the weed or whatever, you know, about oh, the yeah. legalize this stuff everywhere. And you get knocked with a whole bunch of stuff, right? I mean. Yeah, I mean, yeah. As of right now, I got uh, two open cases. I got one in Missouri. And, I mean, you know, so you can Google my name. You can pull up the arrest. Like, they have pictures and everything. The first one in Missouri, um, it was, like, right when COVID had kicked off. And, you know, we were on lockdown here in Florida. A lot of places were locked down. Hell, I'm driving to Cali and back. I'm on the road. It was nobody but like me and the truckers. And coming back on one trip, man, I got pulled over in Missouri, like about an hour and a half, two hours uh, away from St. Louis. I think I was on 70. I don't know if it was 70 or 80 that goes through there. But um, yeah, man, that, they hit me with uh, 32 pounds. Like, yeah, trafficking marijuana, 32 pounds. But I'm bonded out and... And not an hour, man. Like by the time they were giving me my clothes, man, they, they were making me dress back in my street clothes. I'm getting bonded out. I'm not even having an arraignment on it. It's been over two years now. Like they've not arraigned me. They've not done nothing. Like I don't know. I feel like shit. But you know, just the fuck, man. I, I asked you that to say this, right? Yeah. So when you when you're caught up in the game, you're caught up in addiction. I mean, yeah, it's just weed, but I mean. You are putting yourself in a bad position because you've been to federal prison before. Did you forget about Lewisburg when you were doing that stuff? I mean, yeah, I ain't going to lie. Yeah, I did. You know, because one thing about it, Chad, you know, I mean, ain't no good excuse. There ain't no excuse, but, you know, still, I still got to live out here. I still got to do something. And, um, 
you know, especially when it came to the weed, you know, I really sat down and, you know, looked at a lot of things and how lenient they are on marijuana right now. Um, and I felt like it's worth certain, certain chances, you know, uh, they're very good money to be made for like really low risk, um, like getting much time or doing anything. Like I said, cause I got that case. I got another case in Virginia. I'm on bond right now. I cut my ankle monitor out and they told me I wouldn't, I had to have an ankle monitor. I wasn't supposed to leave the state of Virginia. That was a year and a half ago, man. I cut that shit off, came home and ain't look back. Let, let me say this though, because there are people watching right now. Everyone's like, Oh man, it's legalized in New York, this amount and that amount, but it's not federally legalized yet. And oh, what oh. people don't understand is that sometimes people do go to prison for life for marijuana offenses with no violence. If they take you down there and they say, you know what? This is how much weed's in the conspiracy. We're going to career you. Now it's, you know, 292 to 365 months on the guidelines. That's 24 to 30 years. And a lot of people and these young dudes ain't thinking like, yo, man, it's just weed, man, I'm good. But really, man, you might not be good, right? But not only are you, oh, not only is it only, you know, you're thinking, oh, it's just a little bit of time. And I'm going to do a video on this. I had a family reach out to me. Kid got caught with a gun. He had seven months left to go home. 77 month sentence. He's in USP Canaan. And his cell, he kills him. Family don't even know how he got killed, but I reached out to a couple dudes that I know over there in Canaan. And I'm like, yo, what happened in November? And dude's like, yo, man, that's what happened. Dude, cell, he killed him. They were beefing. So now I know the story. The family don't even know it. So you could be right. out there just selling weed and end up in the USP because you got a bad oh, criminal yeah. history. You went to state prison. You went to the county jail five times. And now the feds say we're sending you to a federal penitentiary and you could end up dead for a weed case, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, and no doubt. And that's one thing... Um, you know, I want to say, man, is, you know, I I definitely am not trying to glorify anything I've been through or still am going through. Um, you know, there's a lot of aspects of my life I would like to change or whatever, whether I am or not, it's neither here nor there. But I wanted to come on here because I love the message that you're pushing out here, man. You know, you're trying to you're trying to push positivity, man. You're trying to help maybe change somebody's life that watches one of these videos man and sees this is not what it is and um yeah no you, you're 100 percent correct man a, a little mistake man a little bit of weed or something you act like this that third no it can get you put away for a long time where you can lose your life you could i mean anything can happen man and it's happened you know it's I, i've seen it so many times and uh this is not the life this ain't this ain't no cool life man it's not at all man and any youngster out there, you know, that's in the streets, bop in, getting a little money and think it's cool, got your little girls, man, find you something else to do. Get you a legal hustle, man. There's a million legal hustles, man. There's so many ways to get legit money out here. You know, I'm just lazy, I guess. You know what I'm saying? I'm stuck in my ways, you know what I'm saying? But don't be dumb like me, shit. Let me ask you this, right, Tree? You know, you talk about, you know, the pushing a positive message. I, that is what I'm trying to do. I wasn't always pushing a positive message. When we knew each other, I was, you know, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, you had you had to live with a different mindset. You still had 30 years to do, bro. You There was no positivity. When you're in them penitentiaries, bro, you're not, it's not, you know, roses and daisies and like hug it out and shit. It's not, nah, man, you know, you got to be a man. You got to stand on yours. And you have to be aggressive. There's certain things you had to do. Like I was at the end, end of my road so I could give it up, but you, you didn't have that uh, luxury. You had to be who you had to be. No doubt. But you know, now, you know, like we were talking about addiction, one of your friends ends up dying, right? Where does she die at? How does that tell the people how that ends up happening? Yeah, man, that's, um, uh, and it's like, you know, it's kind of a touchy, uh, situation just, but man, it, it was, you know, a girl, man, had my heart, man. It was just my home girl, man. Um, and so she had just got out of jail. I had a girlfriend for like the previous year or so. And I seen my home girl went to jail and stuff, but I never reached out to her, never sent her, you know, just out of respect for my girlfriend. You know what I mean? That I wouldn't be cool with her reaching out to some dude that, from her past that went to jail. So I didn't do nothing. And actually, when I went to jail in Virginia, I was up there for a few weeks before I bonded out and came home. But me and my girl had broke up. So when I get back home on bond, 
my homegirl reached out. I knew she was out of jail. I had saw where she got released. And one day she reached out to me. Um, she had to hit one of my homeboys up on Facebook, something, you know. She got my number. She was telling me, man, Cam, you are so hard to get a hold of. Like, I, man, she's like, I was trying to get your number for months. But um, I was like, hey, yeah, what's up, man? You know, come through, kick it, whatever. And, you know, she come hang out, man. We're chopping it up. And she got out and she was trying to be clean and do do the right thing, man. And um, But still, you know, I'm getting high. I'm over here smoking fentanyl, doing whatever, man. And, uh, yeah, we kicked it one night, man. And, you know, she's looking at me. Like, I know she don't really want to do it, but she's looking at me while I'm smoking. I'm like, what's up? You want some? Bro, she took one hit off that shit. We're in my bedroom. I'm sitting on the floor with my bed, with my back against my bed. And she's like laid across my bed. So like her head is like at my head. You know, she took one hit, gave me the full back. I guess she passes out. I'm smoking. I pass out. And um, yeah, I wake up, man. But I don't even know how much like later. And my leg was kind of tucked under me and it was dead. You know, so I'm moving it like, yeah, you know, it was like it was a sleeper or whatever. I'm saying something to my homegirl and shit, and she's not answering. And you know, like, you know, I turn around, I start to freak out and turn around, and look. I see close and like I see that she's breathing. So I was like, all right, she's good. I'm just gonna go in the other room, man. I'm, I'm gonna leave her alone, let her get some sleep or whatever. I go in the other room and pass out, man. And uh, yeah, she died, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? I don't know what I was thinking, bro, because I do this shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, why I would leave her alone. But yeah, man, like I went and passed out on the couch, man. And uh, about four or five hours later, I wake up. And when I get up, I walk in my room. I know something's wrong immediately, man, because like I had left the light on and she ain't moved a muscle in four or five hours. And, and man, she was gone, man. Like, you know, I went to try to wake her up, man. And she wasn't there no more, man. And like, you know, that shit really fucked me up, man. What was that? Was that the Fetty? Yeah, man. Smoking it, man. She, she took one hit off that shit, bro. And it killed her. And, and it, that can happen. And she used to do it. She just had clean. She had went to jail for a few months and got cleaned up. So her system. What, and, and see, I think she was doing Xanax, too. You know, Xanax and opiates don't mix. I, I, I don't. I hate Xanax, bro. But um, I think she, she did eat some Xanax, like, earlier that night or whatever. I think that's one of the reasons why she had that. But... Yeah, man, she lost her life, man. And, I, you know, I put a lot of that shit on my shoulders, bro, because, like, I just left her. Like, I'm supposed to know better. You know, just, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just leave her in there and go in the other room. But, you know, when you're getting high and doing shit, man, you, you know, your mind ain't, ain't totally clear, bro. And just not thinking right, man. It cost my homegirl her life, bro. She died right in my bed, man. You know, there's got to be a point, you know, and I, I thought this was the reason you had stopped talking to me because I knew you started getting high again in prison, right? And I used to get on you like, come on, bro, you're better than that, man. Look at yourself in the oh, mirror. And I felt like you quit talking to me because maybe you were embarrassed because it wasn't my thing. I didn't get high. But you know what, Cam, man, what it comes down to, there has to be a point where you know you're an intelligent dude, bro. You know, you realize that, like, I'm going nowhere with this. I can't have a job. I can't maintain a house. I can't. I can't do, do nothing, man. I mean, like my life's in shambles. So there has to be a point when you have to decide, is this what I'm going to do until I day I die? Or, you know, am I going to get my life in order? And that's a decision that you have to make. And you know, a lot of people are like, oh, but man, I'm addicted. I get dope sick. But there has to be a point. And for me being in prison, from you being in prison, and I'm not saying that that's an excuse because people do get dope sick. My father went through it. But I think it comes down to a point where, man, if you don't want to do something, you're going to tough it out and get through the dope sick okay. part and change your life, bro. No, and, and you're 100% correct, man. You know, people always talk about hitting their rock bottom, man, hitting their rock bottom. And, fuck, I don't know where my rock bottom is, man, if I ain't hit that shit yet. You know, but everybody, you know, people that get clean, you know, they're few and far between people I met that, man, have changed their life and got, you know, did it. But, you know, they finally, they just, they made a decision, you know, because nobody can force somebody else to get clean, you know. I get jammed up on something and the courts tell me I have to go to drug classes and this and that, that that's never going to make me clean because I, I don't choose to be there. I'm being forced to be there. You know, I have to want that decision, make that decision. And, um, and yeah, man, I, I wonder that shit too, man. Like, well, what the fuck do I want from my man? Look, 
bro, I got a lot of good people in my life, bro, that care about me and shit. And one thing, like you were saying, was you thought maybe one of the reasons because you were getting on me. Bro, I got a lot of people that be on my ass about that shit, bro. And um, I, I, I never get upset from somebody telling me that I need to straighten my life out, get off dope. Because if you didn't give a fuck about me, you wouldn't tell me that shit. You know what I'm saying? So that's coming from a place of caring about me. So, like, I'm never going to get upset for somebody trying to tell me, you know what I'm saying, something that they want that they want to see me do better, you know, to be around. And, um, like, I've had a lot of, man, good friends, man, that just, you know, they hate that shit about me. They hate that it's what I do, you know, and, like, I don't know, bro. You know, I can sit here. I, I can't give you an answer. And that's, like, and that's, 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 it's stupid, for real. In one sense, but like it is what it is, you know. But I don't lie about it. that's one thing too. Like I don't, I don't give nobody no bullshit about it, you know. I don't do nothing, man. I can't look my mom in the eye and tell her what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? And um, I ain't proud of it, but look, man, it is what it is. There's gonna come a point where either you're gonna change your life, man, or unfortunately, man, you know. And I don't want to see this happen to you, man. That someone's gonna walk in the bedroom and it's gonna yeah, be find you not me, moving bro. one day, you know. And I hope I that does that. not happen, brother. So, listen, man, I just want to tell you, man, you know, I appreciate you coming on here, sharing your experiences, man, and, and your stories. And you know what, man, I want to stay in contact with you, man, because we were like this, bro. You were my boy. You were my friend, man. We hooped yeah, every man. day. We, you know, we talked shit. We joked. We played. And you know what, man, I'm just happy that I'm out of prison. I'm happy that you're out of prison. I want to see you stay out, man, and I want to see you stay clean, bro. I appreciate it. You know what I'm saying? And I, I can't promise you I'll stay clean, bro, but... I mean, I, I need, you know, I, I ain't going to feed you no bullshit, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I do know I need to do something, bro. You know, you ain't but about 15 hours from me, man. I jump in the car right now, man. Come uh, <laughs> one of these days. One of these days, man, when I'm off parole or something. Hey, hey morning, man. listen to yeah. me. Uh, you know, I want you, you know, I know that you're caught up in that life. You're caught up in that addiction. But like I said, you're an intelligent dude, man. You got a last message, something you want to say before we go? I mean, shit, I just, you know, any, anybody out there watching, man, that's just, man, if you ain't been in prison and, you know, you're just interested in this whole thing, but you're living in this lifestyle, man, man, get out, man. This, this is nothing, bro. You don't want to be living my life. You don't want to be 40 years old, ex-con, living at your mom's house with an addiction and not caring about what happens to you. You know what I'm saying? Like this this ain't this ain't no life, man. You know, there's so many better ways, man, and just you know, don't be mean shit. <laughs> Listen, man. I'm going to get ready to close the show. Tell you, man, I appreciate you, man. Tell the people, man, if you're watching, I hope you learned something. If if you watch this and you know someone that you should share it with, Man, just hit that share button, man. Share it with him because there is a good message here. There's a message that people need to hear. I'm going to close the show. Again, man, I appreciate you. I thank you. With respect, we on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out.